Well, after that message from the children, we can say amen and go home. That was a sermon in itself. You know, it reminded me of uh, times of the reformers in the Scandinavian countries. Um, There was such persecution that the adults could not speak in public. And so God moved upon the children, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that rose up and stood on tables in different areas and actually preached the gospel unto them. And it inspired me with that thought back of time past that that uh, fulfillment being a reality for us soon again in these times in which we're living, I don't think is far, far off. You know, we're told that uh, it's good to remember how God has led us in the past and how He has taught us so that we can have a firmer faith for the time in which is at hand and be better prepared to be an empty vessel filled with the Spirit to reveal to a world, a dying world, the light of His glory in the midst of darkness. Also, in that children's story, I think I'm going to have to turn in my red Bible in for a black Bible. Because I don't have what they call the black book. So, thank you. I guess it's time to turn that in. Um, By the way, God uses all walks of life, shapes and sizes, and colors of skin. So, there's no limitation to what God wants to do for for humanity in and through us. And with that, I am that empty vessel that God desires to use today. Will you join me as I ask him in a special way for that blessing? Loving Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you said when we ask, the promise is we shall receive. Because worthy is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Through his blood and by his merits, we petition your throne of grace to bring calm and peace in the midst of our storms and bring clarity to our minds that you would speak boldly of what we need to hear for such a time as this. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves and not resist the prompting of your spirit in our life. And may we all be led to repentance and true conversion of heart this day. In Jesus' worthy name we ask. Amen. Well, brethren, turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with verse 5. The Bible reads, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had translated him. For because of his translation, he had this testimony. What was the testimony? That he pleased God. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible To please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This morning's message is learning to please God. Learning to please God. You know, by nature, we live to please ourselves. And to have a change of thought process to where you, yourself, and I are not the center of why we make decisions is a supernatural work. It's a divine change of heart. The Bible records it as many different experiences, but it called as a new birth, being born again. And Jesus said to a man that was a a preacher, administrator in the church and a teacher 
for over 40 years, and he says, you need to be born again. You know, when I looked at how Jesus dealt with Nicodemus, I realized there's no respecter of person. You know, the arrogance that we can have so easily because we've had titles or because we've been in God's work for so long that we feel entitlement for certain privileges or experiences or understanding or that we know because we studied. God wants to put us in our proper place. And I pray that he may do that with wisdom and gentleness this morning as we contemplate how we can learn to please him. This testimony of Enoch is a man that was one of two men that have been translated without dying, that has been directly taken to heaven. That's what translation means. He didn't pass through death and was resurrected. In fact, the Bible records more, for, more, more clearly, patriarchs and prophets in spirit prophecy. He wasn't even aware of resurrection. Can you imagine that? So my question is, what was his motive to be so faithful to God to actually please him in what he did for 300 years, as the Bible records? Before we go there, I want to take a look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Number one, that means you need to have faith in God in order to please him. The Bible says in Romans 14, 23, without whatsoever is not of sin. Ah, you are listening. Good. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So every time you and I doubt or question or have an attitude of disbelief on what God has made plain to us through his word and through the example of his own life, that actually is sin. It is unfounded because of out of all the evidence that God has given humanity to put their trust in to believe that God exists and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, there is account after account after account in the Word of God and even in living history today that testifies God exists. He is real. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And this is where God says, taste and see for yourself that the Lord is good. Until we make God a personal experience for us, it's just white, black letters on white paper. It's information. And for the children and youth, Many times, that's the way they receive it. Because what they see and what they hear are two different things. And this was the secret of life of Enoch. His life was a testimony As it says, this is the testimony that he left. And what was the testimony? That he pleased God. In pleasing God, we find that there must be a faith. I want to make it plain. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Well, then what is it? Verse 1 tells us, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. To make it plain, you trusting what God has said that he will do because he has said that he is able to do it, and you believing in what he said he's able to do, that he will do it, and then taking it to the next level, trusting that it is done and thanking him for it, before you see the actual evidence of the fulfillment of what he said he can do. That is faith. In fact, early writings, page 72 and 73, calls it naked faith. When you claim the promise and thank God for what he has said he's able and desirous and wants to do and expecting it 
as if it's already happened and thanking him for it before you see any evidence thereof that it has become reality. That is naked faith. Naked because you don't see anything with your own eye. There's nothing tangible before you go and thank God for what he has already done. But you accept it just because God's word, you believe that whatever he said, his promise will be kept. Because he's not man that he should lie. And then he's given us greater evidence, and that's at the cross of Calvary. The very first promise he gave to humanity after sin was, he will die their death, he will pay their price. The Bible records it as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Spirit of Prophecy says, as soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. Jesus said, I will pay the ransom, I will die their death, for the wages of sin thereof is death. I will die their death. That's why Adam and Eve didn't immediately die. Because as soon as there was sin, there was a substitute. A surety. And that fulfillment was at Calvary. A little over 2,000 years ago. And when that fulfillment became reality, he shed his own blood. Therefore, he gave his life. So I'm going to ask you, what more do you want God to do to prove to you that he loves you and have your best interest? What more do you want as evidence to assure you that the word he says in there is for you and he will fulfill it? You know, I'm reminded of a conversation that a preacher had with an actor. How is it that you, an actor, portray things that are not true as though they are? And the actor said, how is it that you, that actually have something that's true, portray it as though it's not? This is why our Christian experience has not had an impact upon children, youth, and young adults. It has become a dead letter because we go through the routine of theory, but they don't see the actual power and transformation and reality as something tangible that they can see in your own life making a difference. Enoch made a difference. And he left a testimony of that difference. Turning your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 5. And let's get a little more insight of what the secret was for Enoch. In the book of Genesis chapter 5, beginning with verse 18, And Jared lived a hundred and sixty and two years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived, after he begat Enoch, eight hundred years, and begat sons and daughters. Verse 20. And all the days of Jared were nine hundred sixty and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived sixty-five years, and begat who? Methuselah. And how old was Enoch when Methuselah was born? 65. Verse 22. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. How long? 300 years. And we think if we're doing three days or three weeks or three, three months, let alone three years, let alone 300 years, Verse 22 says, And he walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God. 
and he was not, for God took him. What did Enoch do? And when did Enoch learn to walk with God? When did his walk with God begin? Huh? When Methuselah, his first son, was born. There was something in that experience of a new birth of a child that came from him. A responsibility set in in an understanding of a relationship that he never really fully understood to that po- until that point that changed his whole dynamic and relationship between God and his, himself. As he understood more fully his relationship before his son. This is what I want to talk about today. Well, you say, I thought, Chris, you were here for the youth and young adults. That's right. Do you realize what forms and transforms and shapes and molds these children and youth more than anything? It is the environment and their homes which they come from. It is the role of the parents. I'm going to be honest with you. After the 20, let's say, 22 years of ministry, the majority of what I hear of the pain and heartache of parents about their children is their children that have gone astray. And what can they do now? What I want to present to you is what God has presented to us in the beginning as the answer and solution and the plan. Learning to please God. Until we learn to walk by faith ourselves and learn how to please God ourselves, are you going to expect your children to have any different experience? You can't expect something different when that's not what you've offered. Enoch understood this more than anything else when he understood the solemnity of this responsibility of a new child being brought into this world and understanding what God's obligation was as him, as a father, as a husband, and as a man. And men, I'm going to talk about this for us for a moment because really the weight belongs upon us. The mother will get to you soon. And yes, I was a mama's boy. Close ties there. And that's natural, especially those early years. But the role of a father has been dismissed degraded, and unfortunately almost completely obliterated in our society as a real, correct, honorable role model of what that godly example really looks like. Many don't even have a father in their life. Or if they do, the conflict has been so conflictive it has been difficult. I remember a woman in her late 40s, early 50s, came as a health guest at the Lifestyle Center where I was working at many years ago, let's say 20, 18 to 20. And the impact that this woman had in such trauma the very first night, the response was an emotional one in the midst of worship. And she says, and she got through, got up crying and left. Within the week, she had shared crying her own trauma and how she could not even wrap her mind around a loving, compassionate Heavenly Father because that was not what she saw nor received. In fact, she didn't even want to call God Father. She always wanted to pray to Jesus because it was such a trauma. Just the term. How can God heal such deep hurt and wounds and trauma to get a clear perspective on who he is 
when we have a, such a drama, traumatizing experience on the opposite. This is what God wants to heal, and He is able. Be honest with you, these are the things that we really don't talk about because they're too painful. They're too shameful and embarrassing. And yet, how many times I have seen and run into people dealing with health issues, the Bible, Spirit of Prophecy says 90% of disease, its foundations laid in the mind. People come with a whole list of different variety of health issues physically, but not understanding that their mindset of the fears, the anxieties, the anger, the bitterness, the remorse, the guilt, the shame, the break down the life forces and invite decay and death is really the root of the problem, not just mentally, not just spiritually, but physically as well. And yet the traditional American, American, you know, American Medical Association does not address this. It doesn't deal with the whole person. That's why in the days of Christ there was a woman with an issue of blood and spent all that she had on money for many years on physicians and still was not healed 12 years later. And you think that there's any different testimony with people today? That happened to my own mother just a couple months ago. They said, there's nothing more we can do for you. Brethren, we need to look at what God has said as a person, how to take a care of us from the inside out, from the root issues of our pain, Amen. the real issues of our sorrows. And this is what God wants to restore in our families and the children and youth to where there is an environment that where God actually is presence of peace, of true love and liberty is expressed and experienced. To where when God's name is mentioned, it's not just because it's time for worship and it's just the routine because that's what we got to do at this hour of the day of family worship. But where you guys are actually engaged and excited what God's going to share and how he can help you through this day. And what new revelation of his love that he can help you. Or understanding to help someone else better. We go through the motions, but God's wanting to make it real. That was the difference with Enoch. It became raw and real of his solemn responsibility. What am I going to do with this child, Lord? How can I train him up? How, what should I do? And that became the secret of his success. As the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, he learned to pray without ceasing. In fact, the we're told this, when we learn to do this, our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk to a friend. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Often our hearts will burn within us as he draws nigh to commune with us as he did with Enoch. When this is, in truth, the experience of the Christian, there will be seen in his life or hers of simplicity, a humility, meekness, and lowliness of heart that show to all with whom he associates that he has been with Jesus and learned of him. That is the impact that people will see now. This beautiful experience of Enoch actually warms my heart because it gives me hope. I can't say that this is what my household was growing up. I didn't study the Bible for myself until I was 18 years of age, almost 19. So for me to hear this context was something new. What do we do in the home, and how can we practice this presence of God? Let's take a look at what God says first and foremost in Amos 3.3 3 of how we can learn to walk with God. 
as Enoch walked with him. Turn your Bible to the book of Amos 3.3. The book of Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? The answer is no. Walking with God is learning to be in agreement with God. Why are so many young people not in agreement with their parents? Why is it when a certain age gets, is like a, a, a switch flips, and all of a sudden, everything that mom and dad says, they're looking to do contrary? Or all of a sudden, a, a switch flipped, and they are now more intelligent than you are. And they seem to know everything of life that you just are out of touch and don't have any clue about. The teenage years, the disqualifying and discrediting mom and dad to where you become the all-knowing. Doesn't that sound so satanic, so Luciferian? Oh, new wisdom, you are the center of it. And yet that is the great deception of the enemy. But these steps are incremental. And I want to take us back from the beginning of the counsel that God has given and what Enoch learned. For the children, as their firstborn, what is the number one first principle that they are to learn? You can answer. So child guidance says the very first lesson that the child is to learn and is to be implemented, instilled in them, is implicit obedience. What type of obedience? Implicit. implicit. Why? Because Spirit of Prophecy says that the parents are for the children as God is to us. So the parents take the role of God in the life of their child because the child can't discern can't reason from cause to effect. So until that maturity, physical, mental, and spiritual develops, there must be an implicit trust, an implicit response of obedience to be developed. That is the secret of success. That is also the secret of us in our walk with God. You want success in your life, implicit obedience to God? is the secret of what he demands and desires of us as his creatures. Parents, is it a double standard to where you go and ask and offer something of your children, but God can't do that to you and I? This is the context that God's trying to help us to learn. Enoch understood when he realized this, I need to give an example, a godly example to my children of implicit obedience. And that's where he constantly learned, Lord, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to deal with this? What's your perspective and view on this? To where every day it was a constant conversation with God as to any close friend that was constantly with him. He depended upon God in every little thing. He depended upon him to give him counsel and wisdom and not upon his own understanding. This was the secret of the success of Enoch. And this is what the example was that he left for his own child to, and children later to exemplify and learn from. Parents today, I'm going to tell you something. You think, oh, they don't know. You know, you go and tell your children and they're goo goo ga ga or whatever, the little childlike baby. And they think that you can't expect obedience or for them to understand at that age. And the moment you go down that rationale, you're going down on a slippery slope because they've already started deceiving you. I know by experience. The natural inclination of our fallen natures is to do what we want to do. That we're in charge. That everybody yields to our demands. 
When mama says, no, this is the time schedule when you will eat and when you will sleep, it may be fuss and fight for three or four nights, but you know what? After three or four nights, the child learns you can fuss and fight, but you're not going to get your way. And do you realize after those three or four nights of intense struggle, it learns it's not going to get its own way in that department? There was a lot of close friends. This was their, their conflict, and the mother wasn't getting enough sleep. In the middle of the night, constantly having to get up. And, and finally, in the first few nights were rough. And that baby was fussing and trying to demand its rights. And for many sensitive and very emotional people, it almost seemed like baby abuse. You're trying to withhold food. But you know what? The child learned very easily. The principle of temperance. There's a time for everything. And from that day forward, after a couple nights, difficult nights, that mother was able to sleep sound, and so was the baby for the rest of its babyhood and childhood. So what is more loving? The discipline of a few nights and prayer in the heartstrings of a mother and father being pulled? What is true love? Are you more interested in developing a character for eternity of principle and temperance and discipline? Or indulgence and passion and appetites to be indulged in, which just infuriates more the character and makes it more aggressive I'm just giving you simple things from the beginning. And these are things that later in life, as the first three years were told, are the most pliable years of that child, right? And the fundamental lesson is obedience. Why? Because as the child learns implicit obedience to the parent, as it grows older in that transition of maturity, of rationale and understanding, they're able to transfer that that's continue to develop that they can learn to transfer that to God in their relationship of implicit obedience and trust to God. Does that make sense? And so as you as a godly parent, your point is educate, educate, educate. Because everything for them is a sponge, is learning process. And as you go through and take this child and teach them by example and to now as they get older and they're able to start reasoning, now you can help them to start looking from cause to effect. So that when they come, they aren't leaving the home without the capabilities of making decisions on difficult things that are thrown at them in life because they've always just been implicitly following mom and dad. There's a transition time in the childhood and development to where you need to start educating the will for them to see from cause to effect. And asking them, if you choose this, what would be the roots or the fruits or the results? And if you choose this, what would happen? What would be the conditions? And for them to have conditions, if they don't follow through, what would be the discipline? And when it comes to pass and they don't listen and they have to suffer the consequences or punishment, what they themselves were part of putting together as consequences, they see it just. And so your discipline and punishment is not arbitrary just because your mom or your dad, but they see the justice of consequences. They made this choice, therefore these are the consequences of their choice. Parents, you can't take away the freedom of choice and the will. It needs to be nurtured and developed and guided and educated. And as they grow older, they start, as you build a trust between you and them, what happens? They come to you now for counsel. They come to you naturally looking, hey, mom, hey, dad, what do you think about this? Because they built confidence and trust that you have an appreciation and you deal with them gently and are there to educate and to train, not to scold, not to reprimand, 
not to just be the authoritarian, but to be a true, compassionate parent, interested in them as a person and in their life, in what they like and what they don't like, and helping to educate them through the word of God of what God wants for them. So that when they finally leave home and they have other decisions, occasionally on the big things, they may still call mom and dad. What do you think? But even if they don't, they've received enough experience with mom and dad that they can make decisions looking and thinking, if I choose this, this is going to be the consequences. If I choose this, this is going to be the consequences. To where when they make the choices, they have a, a, a will and a, and a mind that is educated by reason. How many young people today are not educated to make those calculated decisions to reason from cause to effect, and you wonder why they get themselves in such deep problems so early on in life? And maybe they were really obedient children in the home and, and very faithful to you. But you didn't educate them how to think for themselves and how to consider and weigh the options as a friend and as a companion to help them to see and reason through the process. Mom said this, okay. And there was a place but I'm seeing with a lot of parents that transition time of continued education to help them to learn, to take that growth of experience, to be independent, but with education, rightly trained, that when they're rightly trained, they will not depart from the Lord thereof. And so we're so fearful of them departing from us or what we taught them or what we said because it's about us then our authority, our control in their life. We become the center instead of God and His principles. And I find it very interesting today that in conservative circles, things that, let's say, 20, 10 years ago that were just common principles of lifestyle living, today are almost obliterated. The distinguishing line on those things almost don't exist. And one of the observations was because the children, there was conformity as long as they were in the home, but as soon as they left home, they went and did whatever they wanted anyways. And there was a great rebellion. And so we said, well, we didn't gain their heart. Well, that's obvious. You gain their conformity, but not their conversion. And this is the difference between rules and regulations and a true heart surrender to God. And this is why a lot of us as Adventists or Christians in general, we know what is right and wrong, we teach the principles, but we're not converted ourselves because there's been no real heart surrender fully to God as a principle. And in the back of our minds, we go through but I've done this, and I've done that, and I've sacrificed this. And man, parents are real quick when the ingratitude of the children come to give that long list of everything they sacrificed, which are honest sacrifices that have been made. But what about the sacrifice that Christ made for them? Until you help them to see the sacrifice that Christ made for them, there will be no change of heart. There will be no conversion because only God can change the heart and the motive of a person when they're willing to surrender that right of control of their life. And why am I sharing this in this context? It's because I've been told we need to do less preaching and more teaching. And we need to come close to the people and come to deal with the heart issues because these are the things that are really going to be the make it or break it from this day forward. Why do I deal with so many young people and young adults that really are struggling in their decision-making today? I mean, even people my age that a lot of you are sitting here today that are your children that are sitting next to you. This is the context. You are the future. And the future that is next to us, 
This is the reason, unless we understand that God doesn't change, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The problem isn't God, nor his principles. The problem is the way we have interpreted and viewed God and his, and his principles. So if you want to see real change, you're going to have to get a real different view of God, personally. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Christ first surrendered and denied himself and gave his life, and that's what was the secret of his success. Parents, until you give your life entirely and fully to God, you will not find that success in your home. And just so you don't think that this is not just my opinion, Spirit of Prophecy says, Children are the lawful prey of the enemy. Because they are not subjects of grace, have not experienced the cleansing power of Jesus, and the angels, evil angels have access to these children. And some parents are careless and suffer them to work with but little restraint. Parents have a great work to do in this matter by correcting and subduing their children and then bringing them to God and claiming his blessing upon them. By the faithful and untiring efforts of the parents and the blessing and grace entreated upon God, of God upon the children, the power of the evil angels will be broken. That's a promise. A sanctifying influence is shed upon the children and the powers of darkness must give back. You want to see difference in your home? If parents would see a different state of things in their family, let them consecrate themselves wholly to God, and the Lord will devise ways and means whereby a transformation may take place in their households. Child Guidance, page 172. When you consecrate yourselves wholly to God, it says, an unreserved surrender to God will sweep away the barriers that have long defied the approaches of heavenly grace. When you take up the cross and follow Christ, when you bring your lives into conformity to the will of God, your children will be converted. Review and Herald, July 15, 1902. Your children will be converted when you yourself are surrendered and converted. So what should we do, families? If you have failed in your duty to your families, confess your sins before God. Gather your children about you and acknowledge your neglect. Tell them that you desire to bring about a reformation in the home and ask them to help you to make the home what it ought to be. Read to them the directions found in the Word of God. Pray with them and ask God to spare their lives and to help them to prepare for a home in his kingdom. In this way, you may begin a work of reformation and then continue to keep the way of the Lord. Child Guidance, page 557 and 58. What is the most powerful sermon that can be preached. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Do you understand why I'm dealing with this topic this morning? I don't think any parent here wants to have their child left out of heaven. I don't want I don't think any parent here that they themselves would be left out of heaven. I don't think there's any person here that really is looking and longing just sitting here. I have no desire for eternal life and for true peace and happiness that God has prepared for those who love him. But until you make that entire surrender, you will never know what peace is here on earth. And you will never be prepared for the kingdom of heaven.
There are few parents who realize how important it is to give their children the influence of a godly example. No other means is so effective in training them in right lines. There's nothing more that you can say that is going to be more powerful than what you do. <laughs> There's a mother like you. That's right. I know by experience. Just as you conduct yourself in home life, you are registered in the books of heaven. He who would become a saint in heaven must first become a saint in your own family. The measure of your Christianity is gauged by the character you manifest in your home life. The grace of Christ enables its possessors to make the home a happy place, full of peace and rest. How many camp meetings over the past couple of years since I've been back to the States have I participated in and been a part of? And how many people have come up to me afterwards and expressed the conflict in the home, the struggle in the home on so many different levels? We ourselves need to be the solution and not the problem. I realize I can't be a problem anymore for my family. If I want my family to truly believe that God can do miracles and loves them and is worthy to surrender their life to Him, I need to give that example to them to allow God to do what He wants to do in my life. Without limit. To let them see through me that th what He can really do and what He has done in changing me. With my own wife, I need that example to be seen because there are things that come up that are so easy to misunderstand. And yet, if there's true love in our hearts, forgiveness will be abundantly exemplified and demonstrated. And that means when we make mistakes, that the whole long, dirty list of the past doesn't come back up to be thrown in our face. But as Jesus treats us, when we are forgiven, he forgets. He separates it from the east as the west. He casts it down to the depths of the sea. He doesn't continue to keep that record to try to beat us up every time we make a mistake again. And yet, why do we treat one another that way? Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by the love you have one toward another. And he says, a new commandment that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Brethren, God is calling us to do something that is supernatural, that is not in us in capability to do of our own selves. He says, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. I'm sorry, but I've had a lot of enemies in my past, and it is not in my natural DNA of my fallen nature to be redemptive toward them. And I won't go, I don't need to even describe the things that come to my mind of things of retaliation that prompt the worst passions in a human being to want to give back hurt for hurt, pain for pain, suffering for suffering. And the manipulative tactics or things we do because we're hurt that we do that others can feel pain and hurt too. That's selfish. That's not God-born love. And that's the root that's contaminating our lives, many of us, of the root of bitterness, the root of anger that has been destroying our peace with God and even our peace with our fellow man. People don't even go and see family members because of the differences. They don't even come to church anymore because of differences. And yet, we're saying we're preparing for eternity. You are greatly deceived. You're going to have to own up and say, Lord, it's true, I have these thoughts and feelings and they are consuming me 
and I haven't wanted to give them up, but I can't enter heaven holding on to this. It's like Christian. That bag needs to be released, right? That burden. And where was it that he found where that burden could finally roll away? At the cross. And to leave it there. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And God's payment is redemptive for the wrongdoer as well because he wants to save their soul. If Manasseh, who was guilty of 50 years of wickedness, King Manasseh, and saw the prophet Isaiah in half, and yet repented of his wicked ways in his last five years, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. King Nebuchadnezzar, brethren, are you willing to eat grass for seven years if that's what it takes for you to learn to humble yourself? Or would you like to earn, learn an easier way to do it voluntarily to humble yourself? I don't know about you, but I've learned enough lessons in the University of Hard Knocks. I want out of that school. I would rather learn at the cross. Contemplating Christ, learning of his meek and lowly ways unto us, because that's where I find my rest for my soul. And his burden is life. And his joy is everlasting. The Lord desires to do marvelous things in our lives, brethren. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, you need to be more tender and kind and compassionate, not indulgent, neither the mother's, in fact, do you know what one of the most deadly deceptions is? Blind love. As a parent. That you willfully turn your eye to address the thing that you know is not right, but you wink and discard it and disregard it to continue to indulge and give them what they want because you want to keep them happy. You're making them some of the most miserable people that they will be as an adulthood. And for them to overcome those tendencies is making it 10 times more difficult. If you really love your children, then discipline them now with love. Take time to educate them and to let them know that you have a genuine interest in them. I want to just share a couple of points on that. You know, mothers, be sure that you properly discipline your children during the first three years of their lives. Do not allow them to form their wishes and desires. The mother must be mine for her children. You need to tell them what is right and what is wrong and what they will do and what they won't do. How often I hear parents with little ones from one to three, what do you want? I'm just being real. We're told they don't have the educated reasoning to be able to make it the best proper decision. You who are educated and adults and responsible for them are to tell them and let them know this is what you're going to do that they can learn by cause and effect, it's the best way. And later in life, you can educate them and they, they can understand. If you don't, this would be the consequences. And if you do, this will be the consequences. Which do you prefer? And you're educating them to make healthy decisions under your supervision, under your experience, under your guidance, tutoring. That becomes bonding, and that's what binds their hearts to you in love, because you took the time to love them enough to educate and help them through. That's the secret of success. You should correct your children in love. Do not let them have their own way until they get angry 
and push them, and then push them. Such correction only helps on the evil instead of remedying, re, uh, solving it or remedying it. Yeah, my lips are thirsty. After you have done your duty, faithful to your children, then carry them to God and ask, them to, ask him to help you. Tell him that you have done your part and then ask in faith, ask God to do his part, that which you cannot do. Ask him to temper their dispositions, to make them mild and gentle by his Holy Spirit. He will hear you pray. He will love to answer your prayers. What more help do you want? So many parents have to render an awful account at last for their neglect of their children. They have fostered and cherished their evil tempers by bending to their wishes and will. When the wishes and will of the children should, be, should bend to them. Parents, I don't know why you let your children tell you what you're going to do. My mom did not tolerate that from us. She said, what would you say? What would you say? Man, that tough love, that firmness, but love, I knew my mother loved me. I'm going to show you the fruits of that love. Just so you understand that it is real. My mother, not Christian, dealt with love and firmness. And look at the climax. I did some stupid thing when I was 17. 16 and 17. And it caught up to me a month before my 18th birthday. My mother got called to address the issue. And my mother said, tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And these people only knew A. And I told them from A to Z. Everything. Names, details, how, when, etc. And they said, look, we're not going to cross charges. Your son has cooperated very, you know, with us more than we thought. And my mother said, no. You're going to call the cops. You're going to have him handcuffed. He's going to walk out of this place in front of everybody else. He will be paying restitution. He will be staying the night tonight in jail. Juvenile, because it was a month before my 18th birthday. The next morning, I'm before the judge. The verdict of O.J. Simpson trial just came out declaring him innocent, and this judge was furious. This was an old judge. He felt that wasn't the right call. And the gen young man before me, his mother was like fearful of him. This had been like his fifth or sixth offense, and he was just up there with an arrogant attitude, and his mother making excuses left and right. Oh, please have mercy upon my baby. Please, Your Honor. And my mother was just sick of that. And the judge even more so. And so here I come up in my mother, my father, my stepfather, my, my grandfather. And the prosecuting attorney says, you know, it's his first offense. And we're going to lower it to this and this and this. Da, da, da. Basically like a slap on the hand. And my mother said after this, Your Honor, I know this is his first offense, but I, I want this to be his last offense. I don't want to ever see him in here again in a situation like this. So I'm asking that you would give him the maximum sentence that you can give him. The war in my mind started going. That's not what I wanted. But I knew my mother was requesting it because she really loved me and wanted the best for me. Do you understand the context? At that age of almost 18 years of age, the only way I could have at that moment really respected my mother still and accepted it that she really wanted me the best for me instead of being violently angry and resentful and bitter for the rest of my life against her and having this rage just thrill through my soul 
is because she had taught me from babyhood that her word was law and it was to be respected. And yet at the same time, she, through my life, would educate me how to look from cause to effect. We had a lot of personal conversations, and that's why my mom and I were like this. That's why I hurt so much to lose her two weeks ago. And what I'm sharing with you today is something that I'm so thankful that my mother did. But how many youth and children today would be so furious and resentful and bitter to their parents for the rest of their life? Gracias, mi amor. Entitlement is the attitude that the youth and children and young adults have today. But that entitlement attitude comes because parents were indulgent and inconsistent in their own lives and in their own discipline. They were too busy and let the TV or the movies or outside friends and entertainment be the babysitters instead of mom and dad really being the time and the attention to educate, to listen, to help, to train, to teach them right from wrong. And now you go and give them their own cell phone at 10 years of age or younger? Babies looking at videos as from their little babyhood? And we're wondering why we're losing the value of respect of a human being. And the courtesy, the old things of courtesy that used to be just of generations past. Why? It's not a secret. It's our neglect before God. And we're all guilty. We all need to come before the throne of grace and say, Lord, I need a renewed heart. I need to be converted. I need to rededicate my family and my life to you today because I have not been faithful. And so I invite you, if you were that struggling adult, parent, and you say, Lord, I'm the one that stands in the need of prayer, I want you to come up today. I want you to come up because there's going to be no change long term in these children until you as parents make that compromise and commitment with God. You want to change the future, then you're the one that needs to be changed. We make excuses in saying society does this and society does that and all these influences. It is not easy having children today. But God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Are you going to let the strength of God therefore reign in your body and in your mind and in your spirit, which is his? Young people, it's easy to blame your parents. And they are guilty for many things that may have been consistencies been. But now it's time for you to take your ownership of children and youth. Are you willing to give your life to God and to rededicate and be faithful to Him? And to honor your mother and your father, to respect them and to love them and cherish them. If that's what you want to do, renew your commitment today, then youth and children, you come up here. And come up beside your own parents if they're here. If not, you come up alone. Yeah, it's okay. Come on up. If this is what you want to do, you come on up. That renewed commitment. Praise God. You know, all heaven's rejoicing. I want to talk to the children and the youth for a quick moment before we have prayer. Your parents have a lot of stress that one day you'll understand better as you get older. Things that you just don't, that doesn't even cross your mind of concerns and worries and burdens that they, they carry and you don't right now. 
which is why you need to be, have more respect and appreciation for them. You need to be more thankful for the sacrifices they make and the things you do have. And to realize all these blessings come from God. And only God can put love in your hearts and to make peace and joy in your family and to restore relationships and understanding. And we need to ask God today, many of us, to put forgiveness in our heart for others of our family members that have hurt us. And if you are present and you know that you've been hurt or you've done the hurting, that you can be honest and open with that person, that child, that spouse, and to acknowledge that so God can bring healing and forgiveness. You know, he says, when you know that that person has, you need to leave your gift at that altar and you need to go and reconcile with that person, right? That doesn't mean go and sit down again. That means your commitment today is going to go deeper in action. Praise God. Praise God. I'm so happy. Let us pray. Let us pray. Those of you who are here, let us kneel down, all who are able. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for what a friend we have in Jesus all our griefs and sins to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to you in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless care we bear. All because we do not carry everything to you in prayer. We want to thank you for your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts this morning. We want to thank you for the time that you have of a genuine interest in our families and in our lives to show us that there is hope and that nothing is impossible with you. Whatever the difficulties have been, Lord, today we believe that there's solutions and we believe that you are the solution. You have answers. And we lack your love, therefore we ask that your love, divine and holy and pure, would be replaced in our hearts with that hatred and selfishness and sin, that doubt and envy, the anger and bitterness and resentment, to replace it with true, pure love, forgiveness, compassion, joy, and peace. Restore these homes. Restore these families. Restore these marriages. Restore these relationships with the children and the parents and the parents with their children. This is what you said you would do in these last days, and this is what we ask of you through the name and blood of Jesus, because he is worthy. We are not. And let us remember this wonderful gift of grace, the treat, mer, you know, undeserved merit and kindness and love, mercy, though we deserve it not. May we extend that to each and every one in our lives and in our spheres. But only by your grace can this be a reality, Lord. But may the willingness of the heart, the true surrender and commitment to do so be made right now in every soul that you reach. Hear their cry, hear their prayer, and attend unto it, O Lord. This we ask for your glory and honor, that not one would be missing around the sea of glass. And the resurrection morning may be so glorious. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.